heartbeat. Thing that we sang today, Lee, Lee, uh, particularly, Lee particularly uh, picked out these songs today based upon the message today. The message today of every nation, tribe, people, and tongue. You notice all the different flags in the uh, in the videos. Uh, I wore my flag tie today. This is flags of the nations of the world. That's where these boxes are going. You know, these shoe boxes that we have today, they are packed with much love and with prayer. And they will be shipped out, quite literally, to the ends of the earth. In the past, boxes from Rosemont have, have gone to the Philippines, Madagascar, uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, Nigeria, Central African Republic, Cameroon, and other places. Where these are going, I don't know. We'll probably find out in a couple of months. But they're going, God has already intended them uh, for specific individuals. The effect and impact of these boxes are not to be underestimated. Jesus said over in Matthew 24 verse 14, He says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. We're talking about living in the end times. We're reaching more and more to the ends of the earth, and there's still work to be done. And why is that? What will be the result of the gospel preached to the whole world and to all the nations? John the Apostle John, in his vision of heaven as recorded in the book of Revelation, saw what will take place in heaven someday in the future. And that is the subject of our focal passage today. You see, these shoe boxes will have a part in bringing the gospel to the world. Turn, if you would, with me to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, we're going to be looking at 9 through 12 specifically. We'll be looking at a few more verses as well. But 9 through 12 is what I will begin with this morning. Revelation chapter 7, beginning in verse 9, I'll be reading from the New American Standard. And after these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands and they cried out with a loud voice saying salvation to our God who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders, and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne, and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray, Heavenly Father, as we read these words about what we'll, about this picture in heaven one day. Lord, may we be among that crowd. And Lord, as we, as we send out the gospel around the world, may we remember that the gospel also needs to go across the street and within our own families. Lord, may we be found faithful with the gospel in which you have entrusted us. And that through it all, this world, this world will come to praise you. Because your word also tells us there's coming a day when all will call Jesus Lord. Lord, may we be found faithful in doing so now. Move among us today. Touch us. Open up our hearts, our minds our understanding today to your word. 
May Jesus be glorified in this place. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. With all the different languages in the world, there are four words that are common to all languages. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. And Coca-Cola. You think I'm kidding. Uh, uh, that's, that's a fact. Uh, the one I want to focus on right now is that word, amen. And it's a word we all know, and we say it regularly, and regardless of what language we speak, and, 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 most, and most, it is the most universal of all words. And listen to someone pray in German or Korean, uh, French, Portuguese, or Spanish, and, and when they're through praying, they'll end with amen, amen. But what does it mean? Amen is a word mostly untranslated in our Bibles. Uh, one reason is it's from the Hebrew, the Hebrew word amen, amen. And, and when, when the Bible was, uh, the Old Testament was first translated into Greek, that we call the Septuagint, and sometimes it's referred to as LXX, uh, if you have a reference to it in your Bibles. When they translate it into Greek, rather than translate it, so be it. And in fact, in the, uh, uh, in the Greek, it would be uh, genoito, genoito uh, meaning let it be, or so be it. The... Uh, they didn't like to use that, and so they transliterated the word. They used Greek letters for the Hebrew words, amen, and it remained amen. And, and the New Testament writers did the same, and they said amen. In fact, depending upon how it's used, in the, for instance, in the book of John, Jesus uh, used the Greek translated word amen at the beginning of his sayings. Actually, in the book of John, he would say amen, amen, and we would translate it in our English Bibles as truly, truly, I say unto you, or verily, verily, I say unto you. But in the Greek, it's amen, amen. And, and so uh, we look at our focal passage today, and we have a scene around the throne and around the Lamb where the multitudes are clothed in white, and more on that in a minute. And among them were the angels, the 24 elders, and the four living creatures. And now what were the angels and the 24 elders and the creatures saying? They were saying in Revelation 7, 12, they started off by saying, Amen. Blessed and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Notice how they began and ended in amen. You know, when they started off with amen, they're, they're, uh, you know, I, I kind of wonder there because I think even here in church, when I mention something of a particular truth, of a divine nature, something that is true, I'll hear many people call out amen. I believe they were doing the same thing. They were saying amen to what the multitudes were saying. So I want to go back and look at the multitudes, and I want to look at what they were saying. So first, first thing we want to do is look at the multitude. Let's go back to verse 9, Revelation 7, verse 9. And it says, after these things... Uh, let me delay here for just a second. After these things, if we go back into chapter 7 and we were to look at what was happening just before, uh, John saw that, that the 144,000 Jews from the 12 tribes of Israel were sealed. We got the 144,000. These multitudes are not part of that 144,000. You see, that 144,000 was on earth. And it says, after these things... And now the scene switches to heaven around the throne. And he says, after these things, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count. Could count. When we look further at these people standing around the throne, John was asked, and we're going to skip down in our Bibles just uh, for a moment. He was asked who these people were. 
Look down in your Bibles to verse 13 for just a moment. And it says, Then one of the elders answered, answered, saying to me, Who are, who are clothed, uh, saying to me, These who are clothed in white robes, who are they? And where do they come from? Well, that was the question of the hour there. Who are these people and where did they come from? You see, John is overwhelmed by it all. He just doesn't know. He's seeing more things than anybody has ever seen. Anyone living has ever seen. And, and he's overwhelmed. And, and, and the question was asked to explain, not to, not to give John a test. It's not to see what he knew, for it's clear this elder knew. Verse 14 says, And I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Remember, John is being shown events, and he's not necessarily be given information on when all these things will take place. And as far as John is concerned, perhaps uh, in his mind, all that was happening in the present and near future. You see, the church in John's day was experiencing great persecution. And, and the, Greek, the Greek word for have come out, they have come out of the great tribulation. That Greek word for come out in the tense that it was indicates that they have already come out and they are coming out even as they speak. You see, the great tribulation, and we, we think of that, uh, that those last seven years in the tribulation time, you see, that can come at any time. But, you know, when we look around the world today and we look at the persecuted church around the world, there are those today that are losing their families, their livelihoods, and their very lives today. They're losing their lives by beheading and torture. Try and explain to some of these people that they're not in a great tribulation. You see, those coming out of the great tribulation here certainly includes all that have gone before. And what is important here is the washing of their robes. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. But understand that those that are in heaven are those that have heard and have responded to the gospel. And we have been commanded to preach and present the gospel to all nations. Quite simply, in, in Mark 16, verse 15, Jesus said, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Those who hear and respond to the gospel, we need to think about that they are descendants of Abraham. Now think about that for a minute. Uh, God promised, you go back to Genesis, you go back to Genesis, and, and, and God promised Abraham that he would make him a great nation, and he said that his descendants will be like the stars in the sky and the dust in the earth, Genesis 13, verse 16, and it says, I will make your descendants as dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. This is one of many verses in Genesis that is about the descendants of Abraham being like the stars in the skies that you can't count or the uh, grains of sand on the seashore or the dust of the earth. And he said that also to Abraham that he would be a father of many nations, not just a nation, of many nations. And you see, as Christians, as followers of Christ, those that are saved, we can consider ourselves as descendants of Abraham. Galatians 3, verse 29, Paul writes, and he says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. The same with the multitude before the throne. The multitude, a number that could not be counted. They are heirs according to the promises of Abraham made some 4,000 years ago. And note this, they are, going back to uh, verse 9, it says they are from every nation and all tribes 
and people and tongues. Tongues meaning languages. All the different languages of the world. They are from all over the world. I want you to think about that. These shoe boxes that we have here. Some are going to be in that group because we sent the shoe box. Think about that. Think about it. According to the statistics, Lee mentioned it earlier, from Samaritan's Purse, they said on average, uh, according to their count, uh, one person comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus for every three boxes sent. What do we have? 670 some boxes? The number will grow by the time we get there. It always does. Uh, do a little math. That's over 220 people. You know, 220 somewhere around the world. In the course of time, as these boxes are being distributed, there'll be someone saved. You understand, uh, Billy Graham at his big crusades didn't have numbers like that. Can you imagine if we had 220 saved right here in Niceville? We couldn't see them all. Praise the Lord. I'd love to really pack in. We got a bunch of pews in the back that we haven't unpacked yet that we can really load this place up with pews. I'd love to think that we would have 220 saved right here in Niceville. And it says, these people from all the languages and from all the nations and all the tribes, these will be those that are standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They're not there for judgment. They have already passed judgment. They are standing before, before the Lamb because somebody, and there's going to be there and part of that group because somebody cared enough to send a shoebox. Somebody cared enough to witness to their neighbor. Somebody cared enough to be the witness that Jesus has called them to be. And the throne here is the very throne of God. And the lamb being referred to, the lamb that was slain, as referred to in other places in Revelation, is Jesus himself. And in the presence of God, they are clothed in white Robes, clothed in white robes. The white robes, they represent purity and righteousness. And the reason their clothes are white is not because they necessarily lived a life of total, total holiness and purity, but because of the blood of the Lamb, the sacrificial Passover-like death of Jesus himself has rescued them from slavery from the slavery to sin and making them able to stand, to stand pure and righteous before the very presence of the living God. It's not going to be my righteousness God sees one day. It'll be the righteousness of Jesus. And I'll be clothed in that. It's all about Jesus. Jesus has done all that was required. Earlier in Revelation in chapter 5, we read the song that the 24 elders sang. Revelation 5 verses 9, uh, 9 to 10, it says, They sang a new song saying, Worthy of you, speaking of Jesus, to take the book and break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation." And you have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God. And they will reign upon the earth. It's not because of anything that we have done. It's because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And we and others who are saved will be able to stand before the throne dressed in white robes. Now, let's go back to Revelation 7 verse 14 where we were at in a minute ago. And it says that they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Here, garments have been made white by having been soaked in the blood of the Lamb. In fact, wash, that, that word here employed, indicates that a cleansing is involved. I praise the Lord that God has cleansed me from the inside out. 
cleansing is involved. And here, once again, this theology of sacrifice and the theology of substitutionary atonement. That means simply, I was the one that deserved to die, and Jesus died for me. And Jesus died for me. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. I think that came from a hymn. He, yeah. I've got Lee nodding down here. You know, in the mind of the author, John, the author of that book of Revelation, there is no doubt but that one's ability to stand before God in purity is determined entirely upon the shed blood of the Lamb in its application to unholy and stained lives of us, of those who come to the cross. It amazes me that people would reject that, but they do. We have been washed clean from the filth of sin by the blood of Jesus. There are, there are fewer, more beautiful pictures that could possibly be imagined than the remarkable contrast of men being made pure through the sacrificial and substitutionary blood of the atonement of the Lamb. And then we continue reading in Revelation 7, 9, and it says, And palm branches, and palm branches were in their hands. It, it, it kind of brings back images of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. You remember we talk about that on Palm Sunday? You know, everybody waving palm branches and laying the branches in the road so the donkey that carried Jesus could walk across them. You see... According to William Barclay, one of my commentators, he says, and I'll quote, he says, the delivery which he, that is Jesus, gives is not the deliverance of escape, but the deliverance of conquest. It is not a deliverance which saves a man from trouble, but one which brings him, the man, triumphantly through trouble. It does not make life easy, but it makes life great. It is not part of the Christian hope to look for a life, speaking on this earth, looking for a life in which a man is saved from all trouble and distress. The Christian hope is that a man in Christ can endure any kind of trouble and distress and remain erect through them all and come out to glory on the other side. Even Jesus said that. A verse I quote all the time. Jesus says, you know, in this life you're going to have trouble. But rejoice because I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. To stand before the throne of God in the Lamb, who is Jesus, clothed in his purity, shouting victory. At these, the church, is not seen as weary, battered, and worn, but is seen as victorious. Victory in Jesus. Lee, sounds like another song there. Right? Didn't we have that song, Victory in Jesus, in our hymn book? That's what they, the church, is shouting and singing as they stand before the throne and listen to the praise of those standing before the throne. Hear what they are saying, and this is what the angels, the 24 elders, and the four living creatures were saying amen to. And they were saying amen to this. In verse 10, it says, And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Salvation to our God. If you have another translation, it may say that salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb. You see, salvation does not belong to us. We benefit from it. We are the recipients of that salvation. We have been bought with a price. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. He says, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. 
when we realize the full significance of all of this. And, and let me digress for just a second. I'm not sure we can understand the full significance of all of this until that day that we're standing before the throne and we're standing in the presence of the most holy. And when we, and when we see that scene around us, I think only then that we can begin to grasp the full significance of it all. And then we will not be able to help ourselves to fall down on our faces in worship before him. Let's continue, verse 11. And all the angels were standing around the throne, around the elders and the four living creatures. Can you see the picture? The, 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 the crowd that cannot be numbered. And then you had the angels surrounding them who can't be numbered. And all the 24 elders that is mentioned and the four living creatures. And it said that they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. What an overwhelming thing to experience you know, people think, well, heaven's going to be boring. You know, it's going to be one long worship service. We're going to be overwhelmed. We will not be able to help ourselves. It will take all of eternity to praise God for the salvation that he has given to us. And it says, and, and it goes on to say that uh, the bottom line here is, is that they... They were praising God. Verse 12, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God, belongs to our God forever and ever. Amen. So be it. So be it. The bottom line is all glory belongs to God. All glory belongs to God. And when we reach out to those around us and to the world, why? Because all the world needs to be giving glory to God. Revelation 5 verse 13. And we read this. It says, every created thing. This is a day coming in the future. Every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the sea and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. This is why we've been given the command to go into all nations and make disciples. This is why we are to be witnesses to him to the ends of the earth. Because all the world, all the world needs to be singing his praises. A day is coming, and we've read this in Philippians, but a day is coming when all will proclaim that Jesus is Lord. The question is, who's proclaiming it now? 1 Peter 2 verse 9 says, But you, speaking of us, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That is what we need to do, is to proclaim his praises, proclaim his praises to the world. That's what these shoeboxes are doing. They're going to people who have never heard of Jesus, and they're going to be proclaiming his praises. There's going to be tracks that will be put inside of them and other things that will lead the people to the Lord. But that's the purpose. The boxes will go out proclaiming his praises and his love to a world that desperately, that desperately needs to hear it. I don't think we'll ever experience here on earth what we will experience in heaven that worship in heaven will be nothing unlike we have ever seen on earth. And it will take all eternity to praise, to praise him, to give him glory and honor do God in the Lamb for the salvation that they possess and we benefit. And God wants to give that salvation to all. Second Peter 3 verse 9 and, and Peter is saying, he says that is patient, but is patient towards you, not wishing any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. We need to bring that message to the world. 
God wants the, everyone to be saved. There's going to be there's going to be many that will refuse it. The question this morning is, will you be part of the unnumbered multitude praising God? And prior to that time, who will you be telling about the praises of God? Let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're praising Jesus today because he is worthy of all praise. Lord, you are worthy of all that we have. You have given us your all, and we need to give you our all. Lord, may we be faithful as witnesses, and Lord, may we be faithful in going out to the world that desperately needs to hear from you. But yet you have entrusted your message to us. Lord, may we be faithful in going across the street. May we be faithful in going in our places of business or school. Lord, may we be faithful in giving out this life-saving message of the gospel to those who need to hear it. And Lord, as we dedicate these boxes in a few minutes, Lord, may these boxes will go and be instrumental and bringing those to Jesus. Lord, there may be someone here this morning that does not know Jesus. Perhaps someone's listening online to the live stream. Lord, I pray that they come to a saving knowledge of Jesus before the sun sets today. And Lord, that they may be counted in that multitude that is around the throne and around the Lamb. Move among us today. May Jesus be glorified. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.